our top 10 games at Gen Con 2024. <laughs> Welcome to Tantrum Mouse Studio D. I'm Kevin. I'm Melissa. And today we are talking about top 10 plus some. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of games in this video. <laughs> we decided to divide uh, this video into like basically three different categories, but the first two are going to be sort of lumped together. So we're going to go through our top 10 games you can purchase at Gen Con, but we're also going to divide that into two. Yeah, so kind of anticipated ones that we haven't played yeah. but are looking forward to, and then games that we have played so we actually can recommend them because we have played them. So about 20 games in that uh, portion. And then at the end of the video, we're going to do another top 10 of games that we'd like to demo at Gen Con. You're not going to be able to purchase them because they're probably going to be in a prototype format or um, pre-published format. Future Kevin here. As you can tell, this video is already very long. We decided to make the top 10 demo games uh, a separate video, so it won't be on this video. You'll have to wait for later this week for our top 10 board games you can demo at Gen Con. So, so a lot of games to get to. Yes. We should get started. We should, but before we do, I got an honorable mention. <laughs> so oh, why not? You want to grab uh, that one, the even fall mm -hmm. down there? Ah, uh, so this game actually came out at, I believe, Spiel last year, uh, the Spiel Fair, and this was something I was already interested in, and we finally got it um, in the mail and to the table, and I believe this is like, it's sort of just releasing now in the United States. This is a game for uh, two to four players. I don't think. One to four. Oh, one to four. One to four players. Thank you, Melissa. We don't play solo games, so Kevin <laughs> forgets about that. <laughs> you have to send your workers to go get the cards, yeah. and then the cards come into your tableau, yeah. and some of them can have worker spaces that you can mm -hmm. send your workers to. Yeah. Some of them give you instant benefits. There's a little more resource management going mm -hmm. on, too, as you're collecting resources, and like a timing aspect of when you're doing things and like in certain orders. Mm -hmm. So that you can start chaining some stuff, which I really like. Uh, the artwork's cool, like the uh, board game cover, like the gameplay. I would say uh, probably with four players, you're looking at, it says 30 minutes per player, so probably I would say, yeah, two hour game easily. Yeah, one thing that I enjoyed is when you get the cards, they go into your top row, and while they're there, if you harvest, you can get benefits and resources from them, but they won't score you any points unless you convert them, transfer them down to the bottom row where they don't really give you um, the resources anymore. So the timing of that, of how long to keep them in the top row, can you get them down to the bottom row? And sometimes in the bottom row, you can still use those action spaces yeah. on them, and they're a little easier to use in the bottom than the top. They are. Um, and the other thing I like is not only are you using your workers on your own cards, but you can also use workers on like... Um, a shared board? Yeah, shared board. And I took advantage of that. Oh, we yes. Play. <laughs> I, there was a space I wanted. I know that I should have taken it, but I needed to do something else first. And then Kevin swooped in and took that space. It's hard. Like I said, it, there's a little resource management. And if you don't have the resources, you can't like, you know, mm -hmm. play the cards down. And I was like, oh, you can spend cards as resources. Mm -hmm. Um and that's, but it's not a good um, translation. It was like a two to one or three yeah. to one, something like that. But on the board, like you're getting a whole bunch of resources uh, for playing your worker out, like just spending like one card. And I was like, I gotta do that now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so there, like I said, the timing aspect of what you're doing when you're doing it uh, is really important. There's, there is some player interaction with that, especially grabbing the cards and even the cards themselves mm -hmm. will say like, look at the other players, another player's yeah, card. Yeah, you can active. activate another yeah. player's card that's in their top row or something yeah. like that. So you're hoping that they don't bring it down before mm -hmm. you get a chance to activate it. Yeah. So um, enjoy the player boards um, are inset. You have to build them, just FYI. <laughs> um, and yeah, so honorable mention, even fall, um, check this out if you're gonna be at Gen Con. Let's start our top 10. Number 10. All right, number 10, we're gonna do each number. We're gonna talk about the games we played first, and we'll talk about games that we haven't, that we're anticipating. So, 
what's our first game uh, in our number 10 slot? So we have Landmarks from Floodgate okay. Games. Yeah. And this is a word clue giving game with kind of a terrain. So one player is the guide and has the terrain card that shows where the good stuff is and where the bad stuff is. And basically that player has to use one word clues to get the other players to place that tile somewhere on the board. Yeah. And so uh, it can get a little tricky trying yeah. to lead them to the correct They're hexagonical text. shaped mm -hmm. tiles. And so there's multiple sides that a player could place mm -hmm. the, the new hexagon next to. And then you're like, oh, there's two or three hexagons that are sort of in a shape mm -hmm. where you can place the hexagon. And then, so you're trying to like, a little code names, like you're trying to connect. Mm -hmm. What word could I make that could, if I want them to place there, that could connect all three of those in the right place. So, yeah. It, it was a little, a little thinky. Yeah. Uh, there is also a team version of the game where you have two teams competing yeah. against each other. We haven't played that one yet. We've only done the cooperative version. If you want to see this game sort of like as we're playing it, we just recently played around, or I guess the whole game, on our Saturday morning board game show. Check the July version out on that, and you can see us playing it. Now, we already have, like, <laughs> asterisk, because we have a second game yeah. in this category yeah, for number, number 10. 10. So, a uh, small box game from All Play called Things in Rings. It's got a little, little Dr. Seuss sort of <laughs> feel to it. Feel, and even, like, the art style. Uh, this game is for two to six players. Uh, and it's, like I said, in a small box, but it packs a lot in it. So there's three sort of rings that are like, look like big hair bands. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a Venn diagram. Yeah, and you're putting those rings out. Um, you can play one ring, two rings, or play with all three rings. Each ring sort of has a, an act or a, um, a topic, whether it's like an attribute or things that are about the word. Or there's basically each one has a different um topic like I said and you are playing as the I guess it's the clue giver or the the oh man they're called the ringer or something like that ringmaster the I ring don't master. know <laughs> <laughs> I forget, but there's one person that's sort of in charge and they're giving the clues out and they're sort of seating the board and they're putting these cards that have like pictures and words on them and like it could be like barn or I mean there's like Penguin, toothbrush, yeah, hundreds also of words, and they're placing them out, and they're like, "Okay, is this word?" So yeah, the the clue giver seeds the board with three of these, yeah. and then each other player takes yeah. a turn by taking a card from their hand and putting it in the ring they think it goes right. in. Is it just the red ring, yeah. or is it the red and yellow yeah. ring? The clue giver is. <laughs> helping. So th when he sees, he's putting those words mm -hmm. in the right spot, which I was, which I was saying. Mm -hmm. So he's like, is it match these two? So like Melissa was saying, a Venn diagram, it would go in between the two mm -hmm. rings. And uh, then the players are trying to figure out like, okay, is it because it has one vowel? Mm -hmm. um, is it because it's a uh, barn uh, has animals and it has one vowel? Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of things going in your mind. And... Yeah. One ring could be living thing. Another right. ring could be has double letter in the word. <laughs> And then the other one could be, it melts or yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, so a very enjoyable. It's we, I think it says um, two to like I said two to six players. You could probably play. Probably shouldn't because you're because people are playing out mm -hmm. things. The, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get rid of the cards in your hand. If you're wrong, you automatically draw a card and it goes to the next player. If you're right, you get to play a card, play another card, play another mm -hmm. card. If you continue to be right, and once you're out of cards. You win the game. So that's the competitive version. There is a cooperative version as well that you can play if you don't want to be as competitive with the game. Yeah, that's things and rings. All right, now for the game that we are anticipating that um, we haven't so, played so yet, yes, but we... I guess we sort of <laughs> kind of have a connection to this one. So, so we're transitioning from our recommendations of games that we have played to one that we haven't, that we are anticipating, that we think might be yep. interesting, and that is Boop the Halls. Yep, some smirking daggers, smirking laughter. So basically, Boop is a game, and I think they have Boop as well, <laughs> the spooky version. one. Yep. It's a two-player game. You're playing as cats that are bouncing on the bed, trying to bounce each other off and upgrade your cats. 
Well, in Boop the Halls, it's a three-dimensional Christmas tree, so it has multiple layers yeah. that you're Are you trying to boop your cats. the ornaments off or something? I, I don't know. I haven't yeah. played it. Yeah. But I heard that they're going to have a very limited supply at the convention for purchase. Okay. So if this is something you're interested in, don't wait on it because yeah. they're yeah. not going to have a lot. They're only flying in a limited number. Yeah, go check that out. Number nine. Okay, so our number nine game that we would recommend, because, well, I've played it, Kevin has not played it, is Hamster Roll. I now, have actually seen it on the table, so I, like, I'm adjacent. Sort of. <laughs> so this is a game that's actually been available for a long time mm -hmm. in Europe, but is getting a North America release with 25th century games. And it's a dexterity game. It's basically this giant circle that you're going to be placing pieces on. And as you place the pieces, the weight makes it roll. And you're trying to get rid of your pieces. But if it, any... If your pieces, I already know yeah. where this is going. If any pieces <laughs> fall out on your turn as you've placed something, you have to collect them. So you're trying to uh, make other people get the pieces. And there's some rules about... Uh, if I place the large yellow cylinder in a section, no one else can place okay. that same piece in that section, so they have to go to a different, one. Okay. a different section if they want to place that piece. So there's a little bit of strategy of which pieces you place and where you place them. Do you jump ahead and try to make it roll so then the next person, when they play... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it was an enjoyable game. You do need, it's helpful to have kind of a long table so it can keep rolling. rolling. Okay. Cool. Uh, so the game that we have for number nine that you can purchase, but uh, we haven't played yet, is called Middle Ages. Now this is from Studio H, and this is a game for two to five players, plays in about 30 minutes. I don't know, I'm a sucker for like middle age, like... <laughs> art and <laughs> yeah, the, theming. the art and the theming. Uh, it just like drawed my eye in. Now this is a re-implementation of a game called Majesty. I know that this new game, Middle Ages, plays more players two to five. I think the old one, two to four. Anyway, this is an open drafting game where you're trying to collect sets, uh, collect tiles to uh, do a set collection. And yeah, you're doing a bunch of stuff that you would do in the Middle Ages. like. Get money and build stuff and die. You <laughs> probably. <No. laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it really. I think the game looks like a, a an enjoyable game that probably is similar to other games we played, but you know. so probably in the like thirty minute yes. range, yeah. kind of a yeah. lighter, quicker tile it slash says, card game. Harness power of tactical combinations to amplify your income and pave your way to try. And I'm like, ooh, I like comboing. Ooh. So yeah. that sounds interesting. Number eight. Our number eight game that we have played and would recommend is Cities from Devere. Now, this game is designed by Phil Walker Harding and Steve Finn, Dr. Finn. Yep. And we had a chance to play this with Will. It's a city building game ish. It mm -hmm. is called Cities. It's for, <laughs> uh, I believe, one to two to four. Two to four players plays in about 30 to 40 minutes. And basically in the game, you have four areas where you are drafting elements from. There's goal cards. There are tiles to put into your city. Mm -hmm. There's building yep. pieces that yeah. stack for your city. And then there's like these... Icons, sort of. Like little improvements, yeah, yeah, I guess, that you can put in your water sections. Yep. And each round, you are going to get each of those things. Mm. But on your turn, you decide... Which one do you want the most? Which one do you want to go to first? So I may really want a specific tile, so I use my little pawn figure to draft the tile. Yep. Kevin wants an objective, so he goes to the objective. Will wants city pieces, so he goes there. So basically, it's a matter of deciding your priorities. Okay. But sometimes you need to be able to place that tile before you can do the improvement, and yeah. those sort of things. So there is a little bit of a timing aspect to it. There's some uh, end game goals too. Mm -hmm. There are some common goals, some yeah. achievements that you're fighting for, and then one of the things you're drafting are personal yeah. end game goals. So that can kind of 
change your strategy yeah. depending on which of those goals you get. It was, I would say, fairly light. Yeah, I would say fairly light, uh, very easy to play, easy to understand. Play it, play your worker out, get your thing, do mm -hmm. it. You might not get the best thing, so just figure out <laughs> what order you want to do it in. Yeah, so. how to adjust your strategy to match what you've actually gotten. Yeah. I believe it's about eight rounds of drafting and then you do your final scoring. All right, so a game that we're anticipating that we haven't played yet is called Chronologic. Now, we're talking about Chronologic Paris. Mm -hmm. There's actually, I think, three standalone games, but I think Paris is the first one that's coming out. <laughs> one, like... Or at least the one that was on the Gen Con list. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. This is like a futuristic version, a contemporary version in Paris, uh, which are the Paris, I think, is called like 19... Yeah, 1920. So this would be the historic version. Anyway, mm -hmm. this is a puzzly, investigative... Um, deduction oh, game. Oh, I love all, all of those, those words <laughs> for one to four players. Now, it plays in 30 minutes, although they said each scenario can be played up to five times each. I don't know how this... Oh, so maybe there are different endings. Yeah, there you go, different endings. Um, there's public information, shared, or private information. It's like a lot of different things going on with the like puzzly nature of the game. I'm just interested to see like what this game... Yeah, I'm always interested in trying new systems yeah. of the deduction, logic, mystery, puzzle game. So yeah. I will I will say like sometimes I read like some of the um, information on a game and it's like gorgeous artwork, yeah, check, and neat components. Hmm. I'm like, I'm not sure what neat components really They're means. They're very tidy. <laughs> Neat. Uh, I don't know if I would use that word uh, mm -hmm. in that, but it was interesting. I'm sure the components are kind of cool looking. So. Yeah. I may be misspeaking, but I feel like this was maybe a French company and now it's been okay. translated yeah, that's probably into, why there's so many different, um, into um, English. Yeah. So I think it has been around in other yeah. languages before now. Collect clues about movements of the implied characters to determine where they were at the time of the incident. So trying to like deduce, yeah, sounds cool. Do the uh, the murder board coming up? <laughs> there we go. Number seven. All right, our number seven game. We actually have the game here. <laughs> All the other games that we played that we talked about are over at the Meadows House, so we should have gotten them <laughs> ahead of time. Before we did the video. But we weren't thinking. So this game is. Finca from Pandasaurus, and Melissa's gonna talk a little bit about it and then I'll jump in. So this is a re-implementation of an older game called, called Finca. Finca. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just been updated, it's now two to five players instead of two to four. And Th better artwork. Better artwork, yes. Now this was a Spiel nominee in 2009 when it first came out. So Finca is a resource collection game where you are then turning those resources into complete contracts to get points. Now, this, and Rondell, and Rondell too. yes, so you have your workers out on this circular Rondell board and you're going to, on your turn, either move a worker and collect resources or you're going to make a delivery of the resources that you already have. Now, on this board, you can have multiple workers on a slot and you move the number of spaces as the number of workers on that slot of any players. Yeah. So if there are three meeples on the slot that I want to move from, I will move three spaces. Yeah, no more, no less. Then where I land, I get the number of resources that matches the number of workers that are on that spot. So if I move to a place that has one other worker there, then I will get two of the almonds or grapes or whatever resource it is. Yeah. This game, it sounds simple, right? It sounds really simple. Now, to make a delivery, you have to have a donkey card. donkey card, a cart, and you get those by passing certain spots on the circle, the right. rondelle. So the tricky thing is that the resources are limited. So if someone is hoarding resources... It would never happen. <laughs> and say I land on a spot that has four meeples, and I'm supposed to get four oranges, but there's only two left in the supply. Everyone turns in all of their oranges. Everybody, even the person that lands. Yes. Then I collect my four oranges. Yeah. So this can be a little bit of a mean game. Mm -hmm. We played with my parents yeah. and they understood it. And it was, you know, four players. We kind of all did our thing. It but was not, not mean. too mean. I don't think we ever turned in resources mm -hmm. that whole game. Then... 
we played with some other friends of ours. Now, we played a five-player game yeah. this time, and there was definitely some... Uh, purposeful. Purposeful. It's not really hate drafting, but uh, <laughs> vengeful. <laughs> vengeful taking of people's resources. So you can see, everything's open information, so yeah. you can see that Kevin has, you know, six oranges yep. and is getting ready to, ready to on his next turn, to deliver, deliver them. them. Oh. And then Ben decides to go to that was, spot. It was Paul Michael. Oh, was it Paul Michael? Usually it's Ben. Usually it's Ben. But <sighs> we had some instances where a lot of meeples ended up congregating on the same spot. Oh, man. We were like traveling horde. So, yeah. <laughs> Not uh, good. We had some friendships almost no. uh, ruined. I, I think it almost came to blows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I would say we played this two, four, and five. Two players that happened to us once in a while. Mm -hmm. we, we just the way it happened... Because they're, they're limit, the resources are limited even in the player count. So you'll get right. more. Setup is you know, different set up, yeah. based on the But I did players. find, like, you can play the game and not worry about this at all. As, you know, you're thinking strategically, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go to this spot because I have other workers I can move. Mm -hmm. Or you could think, like, why not? <laughs> Kevin then ended up being our chaos player yeah, after like, he got thwarted a few times. A few times. I'm like, <laughs> you know what? I'm just going to go do some collecting of resources and not deliver anything. So, <laughs> Kevin lost. I did, but it was fun there. Uh, halfway through, figuring out, yeah, you need to uh, make sure. <laughs> so I would say uh, definitely more on the interactive side mm -hmm. if you want to play that way. Yep. And it can be a little mean if you have players that lean into that. But yep. that is Finca from Pandasaurus. All right. Our other game that you can purchase, but um, we haven't played yet, is from Portal Games, and this is called AI Space Puzzle. This is for two to five players, and I didn't see how long does it take. It takes about, oh, a half hour. There's a lot of different scenarios in this game because it's a co-op game. You have um, multiple players who are sort of evacuating Earth and they're getting on the spaceship, and then you have one player sort of playing the AI uh, okay. who's trying to help them uh, okay. figure out... So cooperative, not one versus many, not one versus but many. Yeah. One, one role and, and others. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, two different uh, roles, and that person who's playing the AI is on the ship trying to like give them information to get them to the right rooms with the right security keys to get mm -hmm. them. So it's like different scenarios that you're setting up that um, you can play and um, yeah, looks, looks interesting. So communication-esque yes. limits, maybe some deduction, trying to figure out yeah. uh, what the other player is trying to yeah. communicate. Yeah, so there's various tokens to convey the required combination of colors and pawns, but the meaning of the tokens is up to the player to decide. Uh-oh. <laughs> Why did you give me this? Right, so. I think it means this, No. Okay. So, yeah, uh, this has dozens of scenarios with increasing levels of difficulty. So, uh, check out AI Space Puzzle from Portal Games. Number six. All right, so this is a game that I actually previewed last Gen Con, Ooh. and since then have gotten a copy of it. And I do have a review video with more information. Check it out. But this is Open Season from Sit Down Games. It is for two to four players, and it says it plays about 15 minutes per player. Sure. So about maybe an hour, a little bit more for a four-player game. Yep. This is puzzly. It reminds me a little bit of Sudoku oh, <laughs> in wow. a card game format. Basically, oh yeah, I can see this. Basically, on your turn, you are going to be drafting two cards. One card has to go onto your board, and then the other card basically goes into your scoring pile. Yep. The cards that you put on your board are going to determine what scores. Yeah. So, if I put a, a elf in my if you have the most of these, you'll score points. You then I want to have a lot of elves in my scoring pile. But there are also spots that give you negative oh, points. Oh, yes. So if I have a troll in my negative two or three points per card, then I don't want trolls in my scoring pile. There's also a top row. That's what I thought you were gonna talk mm -hmm. about, which I enjoy this part. That basically gives you activations. So if I put a barbarian in a specific slot, 
then every time I put a barbarian into my score pile, I get to activate that action. That's fun. Which right. might be getting more cards to put into my scoring yeah. pile or stealing cards from other players. Yeah. A variety of things. a whole bunch things. of different stuff, yeah. But then there are also restrictions of what you can place in each spot so yeah. you have to think about oh i yeah. already have an elf in the top row so i can't put any more elves there i like to play the advanced game oh, yes. which then gives you either end game scoring or extra bonuses extra bonuses actions for yeah. filling columns with the same attribute because each card has a basically kind of a race and then an attribute like an earring or an eye patch or a crown so with the advanced game you're really getting that kind of sudoku feel mm -hmm. where i need a barbarian with an eye patch to go into this space and if i can do that i'll get a ton of points and activate stuff but you may or may not actually get that combination so i've enjoyed the puzzly nature of this game there are some options that you can build in that are more interactive and take that yep. so depending on how your players set up the board and which things that they choose to activate it could be more interactive or less interactive i also enjoy playing um i sometimes get uh, sidetracked by activating all those fun things and not <laughs> getting points but Anyway, that's my fault. <laughs> All right, moving on to uh, the game that we're anticipating that we haven't played yet is called Gnome Hollow. This is from the Up, and this is for two to four players. It takes about 45 to 60 minutes to play in Gnome Hollow. You are building mushroom groves. It's a set collection worker placement game. You're building these mushroom groves up, and then you're harvesting them, and then you're taking them to market. Uh, it sounds like a fun Euro uh, mm -hmm. type game, strategy game with uh, just the regular getting the stuff and yeah. sending the stuff. I like so. worker placement. I like set collection. Yeah. So. It has a cute cover. The gnomes. So. All right. Check that one out from the app. Number five. Okay. For number five, this is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. We didn't really plan this at all, mm -hmm. but it is the AEG slash artwork by Beth Sobel number because the game that we've played is Cascadia Rolling Rivers and Rolling Hills. We have um, enjoyed all like the Cascadia line mm -hmm. and when we heard about the rolling uh, <laughs> yes the kind of roll and write yeah. version we um, really were interested in that. We actually have a playthrough of both of these all in one video so you can check that out on our channel. Um, real quick what do we like about this? Like what does it bring? Um, well, I really enjoy that each box has, I believe, four yeah. different maps or maybe even more. It yeah. has several different maps you can play with different um, complexities. Yeah. So we played one of the, the easy ones. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we played one of the harder ones and we're like, whoa, yeah, OK, oh, I really woo. have to be thinking about this yeah. a little bit more. So I like the variability yeah. of each box where there are lots of things to explore with how to score and uh, just fill out your sheets. I like so the I chaining that. aspect, which mm -hmm. a lot of roll and write games do this, mm -hmm. but I think Cascadia, these games do this well, especially even the more difficult ones where you start chaining like, oh, if I do this, then this happens. And then I get mm -hmm. this little benefit. Oh, because I get this benefit, I also mm -hmm. get this benefit. So that's what I mean by chaining. I think the Cascadia games, the roll and write mm -hmm. ones do that really, really well. Yeah, if you enjoy Cascadia, if you enjoy roll and writes and combos and things like that, definitely recommend that you check out Cascadia either box from AEG and Flat Out. So moving to the game that we haven't played yet, but it's also from AEG. <laughs> it's called Undergrove. It has artwork from Beth Sobel, <laughs> and this game is designed by Elizabeth Hargrave and Mark Wutan. So if you um, are familiar with Elizabeth Hargrave, she has done Worms, or Wingspan. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> sorry. <laughs> Very famous mm -hmm. game uh, from Stonemeyer Games. And Mariposas. And the Mariposas, butterfly game. Yes. So also, which is kind of funny, this game is called Undergrove, <laughs> um, which is about mushrooms. And, Second mushroom game. And I just talked about Gnome Hollow, which is about mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And this one, and I, I will tell you, I almost put Mycelia on this game. It is the year. On this, on this list. It is the year of the mushrooms. It is the year of the mushrooms. I am, I have heard about mushrooms being very, like, popular. Uh, mm. So, anyway, I, I like 
you eat mushrooms. Mm, no mushrooms for me, so. I enjoy it. So, uh, this has a cube conversion, tile placement, area control, and a little bit of engine building. I like most of those. Yes. Area control, mm -hmm. I'm hit Depends. and miss with yeah. me. Depends. But yeah. the other things I'm good with. It's, it's inspired by real... Uh, Networks of I can't say all these names, but it's it's probably like based off of real like science and, and Oh, because I think a lot of mushrooms have I don't even know if it's their roots It may be something else, but they kind of grow yeah, together yeah. in colonies and they're all yeah. the same organism popping up other places Which makes sense for the word undergrove. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when you're looking this up online undergrove is one word oh, So oh, cool. in the on the box cover it looks like two words, but it's not So if you're looking in BGG one word for undergrad. One to four players. I don't think I said that. And it plays a little over an hour. That is from AEG. Number four. All right. So we are looking at more deduction for That's our number four game that we have played and what would recommend. This is the search for UAPs, unidentified, anomalous phenomena. Phenomena. Do, 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 do. <laughs> this is a collaboration between Bezier Games and Renegade Games, but Renegade, I believe, is the one who's going to be selling the mm -hmm. game. This is in the Search For universe, so yeah. you have the Search For Planet X, the Search For Lost, Lost Species, species. Yeah. and now UAPs. And I would put this as probably the heaviest of oh, the line. Yes. We did get a chance to play this when it was in prototype mm -hmm. form, and... Now it's in all of its glory, published form. And I love deduction. I love logic puzzles. This one has an app, like mm -hmm. the other two yeah. versions, which basically runs all of the logic scenarios and gives you the information that you need to make the deductions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting thing about this one is that it is two concentric circles mm. and ah, the yes. inside one spins it's kind of like the things that rotate with the earth and the outside ring stays stationary so as the game goes on if you stay in the same spot the outside you'll have access to different things in the outside ring of the sky but then the inside ring is the same so you'll probably will want to yeah. move around to access different areas of the sky there's a, an expert side and then a regular side. So depending on how difficult you want it to be, you can choose which side you want to play on. But I enjoy all three of the games, so I definitely recommend this one. All right. Moving on to a game that we would recommend, uh, that, or at least we're anticipating, that we haven't played yet. But I guess this one is a little bit like we have sort of played it because it's this is called foundations of metropolis mm. uh from arcane wonders it's for two to four players plays in about an hour and you're like wow foundations of mm. metropolis that sounds sort of like foundations of rome well you would be correct because this game is literally like the same game except different theme and it's not blinged out <laughs> So we're looking at, and I haven't done much research on it. I'm assuming we're looking at cardboard components instead yep. of the plastic components. Yes. And it's going to be Tetris pieces placed on a board, sort of like in Foundations of Rome, you are drafting a plots. Um, you're going to be doing that in this game. You're going to be drafting plots, which is going to give you sort of coordinates on the board. And then you're going to eventually be uh, getting pieces that match those um, as you make the different shapes on the board in order to place uh, different pieces of uh, buildings on the board, but they're going to be f flat cardboard. So I, the big thing is, if you haven't played Foundations of Rome, it probably jumped to one of my favorite games of all time. Like, it's top 10. If not top 10, it's definitely top 20 mm -hmm. games. I really enjoy it. It's so simple, but mm -hmm. so fun to play. Mm -hmm. And oh, anyway, <laughs> this game, I'm, it's going to have that same experience, except it's going to be probably cheaper. <laughs> and maybe not as tactile because you don't have the three-dimensional buildings. Yes. So we have not played this version right. yet. We've seen a little bit about it, and we have played Foundations of Rome. Yes. So definitely we are interested in seeing what this one brings. Are there any differences? Is it very similar? Mm -hmm. And is the gameplay just as fun yeah. with the more yes. simple components? Uh, and I'm guessing it's more of a modern theme. 
Oh, yes. And not the ancient. Correct. It's Metropolis. So it's like building a city. Like a city. Yeah. All right. That is from Arcane Wonders. Number three. So this is a game we've played and we would recommend it. It is River Valley Glassworks from All Play. Plays one to five players, plays in about 30 to 45 minutes. This game. <laughs> you tell them the backstory. Well, real quick. We played a prototype of this back in, I think, 2016 or 2017. So this game is long time coming. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited about this. This is from designers Adam Hill, Ben Pinchback, and Matt Riddle. The, des or the um, artist is Andrew Bosley. So, man, it's got a lot of things going for it already. A great team. Great team. So we played this. I already loved the game in prototype form. Now, this game, where it is now, we have a playthrough of it. You can check it out on our channel. Woo! I think this could be a Spiel des Jahres nominee in the Ooh, future. So Kevin. I know. Woo! I, I would say it's so simple, yet it, it packs well in a like a, a small, not a small box game, but like a half of a Ticket to Ride <laughs> size box game. It's uh, what, All Play is uh, publishing it, and they have their square ones, and then they have their longer, the longer ones. It's in like the longer. Yeah. Box. Anyway, this game is so simple, yet so complex in the like strategy because on your turn you have some of these colored glass like pieces they're, river rocks. they're river they're like plastic pieces but they have different colors and different mm -hmm. shapes what matters when you're placing it out on the river there's a bunch of um mm -hmm. of these other shapes of like kinds on the river and you're placing them in one of the sections then you're taking mm -hmm. all the gems all the stones um from either side of that and you're putting them on your player board but at that point on your player board, the color matters. Not the shape. Yeah, and so you have like the white ones and the black ones and the green ones and the pur purple ones and mm -hmm. the orange ones. Anyway, you get the idea. And as you're collecting, you're placing all the same color in a column. And you're trying to not only get different colors because mm -hmm. it's going to give you more points, but you're also trying to go up the columns. But you want to go up the columns like Laid yeah, <laughs> later. later on your board because yeah, it'll be board. worth more Way points. Way more points. So people are seeing what colors you're c collecting. They're seeing what colors are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are the shapes. You look at what shapes you can even, you can, mm -hmm. oh, Melissa can't even go there. I can go over here. And mm -hmm. like, there's, the interaction is not a mean interaction. It's like, but there is interaction going on mm -hmm. in the game. And then just the set collection aspect of, of it. I, it's just so enjoyable. Mm -hmm. It's one of those games where it's simple, where anybody can really pick up and play it and do it. But the strategy is where mm -hmm. I think it really comes into play. Yeah, because you'll get into situations where if you take a certain color, it's going to drop your points down a ton. So you don't want that color. But maybe that color is mixed with colors you do want. So then, yeah. you know... Oh, do I take it to get the color I want or do I go over here and get some other things? So sometimes you're forced to take things that are not beneficial for you. Whew. Check out River Valley Glassworks from All Play. All right, Melissa, what game are we anticipating that we haven't played yet? So we are anticipating Reef Project mm. from Board and Dice. This is for one to four players and plays in about an hour to an hour and a half. I well, haven't played it yet, hoping to get a copy before Gen Con because I'm going to be helping at the Board and Dice booth a couple hours you know how to each play day. <laughs> and this is going to be one of their main games. Uh, I would say from what I've seen, it seems like it's not as complex as like oh. their T series of mm. games. It's not a Takenu. Can or, you see some of the ones that we have there? There's oh. like Nucleum, Barcelona. Yeah, it, it's not as complex yep. as some of those, oh, but... It's right there. You can't see it behind us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would probably put it maybe in the medium weight category, not having played it yep. yet. But you are traveling around the ocean trying to help the reefs and get rid of pollution and go up different tracks. Okay. So you're going to be traveling around the board, placing things out, getting new crew members that are going to help you. It seems like there's a lot of comboing and benefits that are going on, resource collection to then transform them into other helpful things bonuses as you go up certain tracks and then bonuses you can activate later in the game. So I I am intrigued by it. I am looking forward to playing it. I have enjoyed most of the games that Board and Dice has put out. So they usually do a quality uh, publication. Number two. All right. 
We are getting close to the end of this list. These yeah. are the best games on the list. <laughs> and why I say that is, in the number two spot, I have Sandbag from Bezier Games. This plays three to six players, plays in about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on player count. Now, <clears throat> this is a trick-taking game. If you don't know what a trick-taking game is, I'm sorry. But it's <laughs> <laughs> basically like rook, hearts, spades, mm -hmm. things like that. You're playing cards and you're trying to win tricks. Well, not in this mm -hmm. game. <laughs> This game, Sandbag, is literally a game where you're trying not to get points. You usually don't want to take drinks. Right, so there's this term called sandbagging. Where you kind of lay back. Yeah, you lay back and legs, like, I'm not going to win tricks. Well, there, that's like a term, and I, um, Ted from Bezier Games took that and made a game out of it, and man, okay, this is not the easiest game to understand. <laughs> But it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't tell, Kevin has really enjoyed this one. He made his own like prototype oh, yes. when we saw it way back before it yeah. was published and yeah. tried to play it on his own. I, well, I play with people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not by myself. Uh, but yes, I played it with uh, prototype and I'm so happy the game is finally out. This game, if you enjoy trick-taking games, this game is definitely need to be on your list. Now, I've played, this is one of my most played games so far in 2024. I've probably played it 16 times at least. And I enjoy it every single time. Not only is it just like, oh, I, it's not just, oh, I'm not winning tricks. The strategy in like, sometimes you do want to win a tricks because there's these rocket cards in the game that give you negative points. So sometimes you're like, oh, I do want to win the trick. Um, and then it's like, even the game itself, you can put cards in your sort of, it's got this hot air balloon sort of theme. You put them in your basket and people are getting those cards to use in the tricks. And you're like, what cards do I want to place in my basket when you're setting up each round? Um, you, oh man, there's just so mm -hmm. many cool games about, or cool things about the game where. Trump can change mid trick. Oh man, that's a big part of the game your cards in your hand, you're like, usually you're trying to like bleed colors out. So like if someone plays mm -hmm. a purple, um, then you're like, oh, I don't have to play purple. I just can play whatever color, but you have to be careful what Trump is. Because <laughs> mm, it can change mid trick and then you yes. are the winner. <laughs> yes, and then you're using other people's cards in their baskets and you're like, oh, if I only have one orange left and I play that one orange face down and then I use whatever color card that, I don't have any orange left in my card. So there's all these extra things that are going on in your head of like, okay, what card do I want to play? Um, do I want to win the trick? Do I not want to win the trick? All that fun game. Melissa, you also like it. Sometimes. I do. I do like Sandbag. Maybe not qu quite as enthusiastically as Kevin does, but I do think it's a really good trick-taking game with some interesting twists to All right. it. What game are we anticipating? So our anticipated game, which this is may be a little bit of an asterisk because I have actually played a few rounds of this in prototype form, I believe at PAX Unplugged. Okay. But anyway, not a real I haven't full. played a full game with the okay. actual game. Okay. And this is River of Gold from Office Dog. Okay. And this is based on the Legend of the Five Rings the universe. universe. Yeah. I don't know anything about that um, IP, but I enjoyed yeah. the game. This game is beautiful. It has an embossed gold river that goes down the board. River of gold? Yes. And I believe also on the, the box cover has some gold embossing on it. So it's shimmery and shiny. Seen it by to get the gold. <laughs> and in the game, you are playing as merchants. You have boats that will be going down the river. You can build up places in the villages and get resources. And basically, and I'm trying to remember because it has been a while. It's okay. There's going to be some die rolls, and the die will determine either how far your boat can move or in which area you can build. So you have to choose what type of action you want to do with the die, but the numbers on the dice are kind of determining your limits. Okay. There is some dice mitigation, so there are ways to modify that. You're not completely stuck, but we found that there were... Definitely some interesting choices about when you move your boat, when you build, when you activate certain things, um, where other players are on the board are also going to matter. There's, uh, I believe, some resources that you're collecting and then spending for different things. So I enjoyed my play of it. It 
it definitely whet my appetite and I wanted to play more, okay. which is always a good thing. River of Gold, check it out. Number one. Here we are, our number one recommended game that will be at Gen Con, available for purchase, Yes. that we have played. That's a lot of modifiers there. <laughs> Caveats. So it is Windmill Valley from Board and Dice. And it, this is for one to four players. Mm -hmm. Plays them out hour, hour and a half. A little longer with more players. Mm -hmm. It is an action selection game where you're actually rotating wheels of your windmill to determine what your actions are. It's probably my, one of my favorite parts of this game mm -hmm. is it's not just one rotating thing. It's two, two. and they're different sizes. So, so they're they... not always rotating in the same, because your actions you're taking are when they <laughs> connect together. <laughs> Woo! Different ones will line up. Yeah, never really talked about the game. It's an action selection game. And there's a whole bunch of different actions that are on the wheel itself, but then you can upgrade and you can add throughout the game to do new actions or better actions. Yeah, more, powerful, more powerful actions. actions. So yeah, Windmill Valley, you are placing windmills out on a board. You are planting, to collecting tulip bulbs and then planting them. Yep, shipping them out. You are shipping them. You are getting helpers. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what they're called. I was about to say crew members, but yeah. we're not on a boat this time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, lots of combos oh, yes. in this game. So you can, your helpers can say, if you do this sort of action, you get this type of benefit. Mm -hmm. Might be points, might be another action. Getting a tulip. Yeah, all sorts of different things that you can combo together in the order that makes the most sense to you. So some some turns, it's just like, okay, I'm going to get some money. Yeah. Other turns, it's I'm going to do this one thing that cascades to this thing that cascades to that thing, which gives me a whole bunch of stuff yeah. that I can then do awesome things with. Another thing we haven't talked about is you just can't just move the action, your wheel, wherever you want. There is a specific way of doing that. It's based on the water level um, that is determined on the board. And you can move it one, two, three, or sometimes even four spaces, or uh, four your, turns. Your wheel. wheel. Four turns. And that whole part of the game can be a little, um, not I shouldn't say frustrating, but it can be a little bit more like it's in, it's brain thinking mm -hmm. because you're like, oh, do I want to skip all these actions to take this one action or do I want, or do I want to spend money mm -hmm. to increase the water level, which will let mm -hmm. me, you know, move the wheel. Oh man. <laughs> fun, fun game. Yeah. I really enjoy this. And what other people do with that water level can influence you. You can still modify it, but it may cost more or yeah. less, yeah. those sort of things. I will say, we've mentioned like board and dice, sometimes they have pretty complicated games that just take a lot, a lot of thing, a lot of time to learn them. I would say Windmill Valley, there's a, there is a lot going on, but it's pretty simple because you're just moving the wheel, taking an action. Now, knowing what each of the actions do, mm. Yeah, it's going to take you a little bit of time to understand them, but not like they make sense. It's logical mm -hmm. sense. And then the comboing. Like, yes, you, lots you, of comboing. Yeah, uh, Danny Garcia. Yes, the same designer as Barcelona. I would say this one is maybe a little easier than Barcelona mm -hmm. to learn. I feel yeah. like the sequence is a little bit more linear. Like, oh, I have to get the tulips mm -hmm. tulips before I can plant the tulips. Yeah. Um, so some of the actions yeah. they are easier to plan out. In Barcelona, it's a little bit more open-ended. Yeah. But I enjoy both of those games. I think Barcelona was one of my top games of last year. I think year. I might like Windmill Valley more than Barcelona. Mm. So, anyway. All right, the game that we're anticipating that's in our number one spot is from Unexpected Games. Were you unexpected? Was, was this unexpected? Mm, well, tell them the title and then we'll see. It's called The Mandalorian Adventures. Now, if you're a Star Wars fan, you're familiar with The Mandalorian. Um, even if you're not a Star Wars, you're probably familiar with The Mandalorian. <laughs> I mean, Baby Yoda slash Grogu right. was everywhere. Was there a few years ago? Probably still is everywhere. But the show on Disney Plus, The Mandalorian Season 1, it's got a number of seasons, but the game is... This game is based off of mm -hmm. season one and sort of the missions that you're going on. This is a cooperative game that each mission takes, I think, about 30 minutes to play. Yes, 30 to 60 minutes to play. And it's for one to four players. And you're all going on the mission together. It's got this map book oh, that you're opening up. Books. 
yep, yeah, kind of cool. And you're going to do the mission and you're all working together to, you know, complete that mission and you're going to go to a new scenario. So as you can tell, it's scenario based, it's cooperative. I did hear that um, there might be sometimes a hidden traitor, <laughs> depending, I guess, on the scenario. I wonder if that's unexpected. I'm sure it was going to be unexpected. <laughs> Someone's going to be like, I'm the traitor. <laughs> So I would like to talk a moment about the publisher, Unexpected Games. They have some really interesting games in their catalog. Voices in My Head, The Initiative. 3,000 Scoundrels. 3,000 Scoundrels. Now, I will say that their games don't always rise to the top of my favorite list, but I am always interested and excited to try out their games because they do unique and unexpected unexpected things that you haven't seen before or that are just different like voices in my head pushing things around that one was what yeah a little little out there but i mean it's different so Mm -hmm. and i really enjoyed the initiative the deduction element Mm -hmm. in that game so i think their games are definitely worth a look at to see what interesting things they're doing in the board game space and to see if that particular game fits your style and what you enjoy. Yeah, so the Mandalorian, like, drew, we enjoy the, the, the theme of the game and then with Unexpected, those two together. Plus, like, we, I think we enjoy these, like, co-op games that have a really good um, theme that draws you in and, of course, good gameplay. So it sounds like the rules might... It like you might get more rules as you go. Okay, from so maybe mission. it kind of unlocks yeah, as more you. Stuff. Go. So anyway, okay. Well, that was our top ten plus you know another ten <laughs> <laughs> games. Uh, games that, as far as we know, should be available for purchase at the convention. But now we're gonna move into our top ten games that you should be able to demo at Gen Con. Let's go. Just a reminder: we are going to have a separate video with our top ten board games you can demo at Gen Con. Don't forget. That was uh, 30 plus games that we just mm-hmm. talked about. And there's so many more that we, we could really, have. We really would love for you to comment below. Like, are you going to be at Gen Con? Um, what games are you interested in? Even if you're not going to be at Gen Con, let us know what games you're excited about. What did we miss from this list? Oh, yes. That has, I'm sh- have you excited? <laughs> Why did we not choose such and such a game and put it on this list? Please let us know. And please like the video. We really want this video to go out and so people can see it and be excited about some of the new board mm-hmm. games that are coming to the market. Um, just like we're excited about these games. So. so if you are going to be at Gen Con, please stop by and say hi. A lot of the Tantrum House team will be at the Genius Games booth. I personally will be helping board and dice during kind of the lunchtime hour or two to kind of help them be able to give their people oh, an easier break. break. Yes. So I'm just filling in a little bit, but we'll also be wandering around, experiencing Gen Con, talking to people. So if you see us, please say hi. We'd love to meet you and talk with you. Don't forget to like, subscribe.